Greetings from General Convention of the Episcopal Church in Baltimore, Maryland. As you can tell both by the slight echo in my voice and the surroundings, we're actually in a stairwell. And the reason we're in the stairwell is because the lo hotel lobby is overrun with people just sitting around and talking and enjoying themselves after, in fact, a very, very intense day of meetings and dealing with resolutions. Two or three things quickly to call to your attention. First thing I want to mention is that, as some of you have heard, there was going to be a resolution presented to the convention raising questions about the legitimacy of Charlie Holt's election in the Diocese of Florida. That, has, that will not be presented to this convention. And the reason that it will not is because a canonical requirement has been fulfilled by the delegates from the Diocese of Florida itself. You see, if 10% of those who are gathered can, in essence, call into question the legitimacy of the election and appeal to the presiding bishop, then at that point the presiding bishop's office must respond. The allegation is the fact that there were voter irregularities and therefore, as a result of that, calling into question the legitimacy of the election. The resolution that was to be presented to convention, which much went much further, not only did it call for voter, raise the question of voter irregularities, it also called into question the legitimacy of some of the comments that Charlie Holt is said to have been made uh, and recorded on YouTube, particularly in matters of race. At this point, what is happening is, as I said, that resolution is not coming before the convention. Everyone at this point is waiting for the presiding bishop's office to review and to see the election itself and to see and make a judgment about whether or not any irregularities in fact actually happened. If it is determined that no irregularities happened, then at that point the election would go to all of the standing committees of the Episcopal Church as well as the diocese of bishops asking them to consent or reject the election. As many of you know, it takes a majority of both standing committees voting affirmatively and sitting bishops voting affirmatively for an election to in fact be ratified. So right now, that's what we're waiting for. The second thing to which I want to call to your attention is that uh, there's been some press about a pretty outrageous, and outrageous is my term, a resolution condemning all the work done by crisis pregnancy centers and accusing them of emotional manipulation and the like and not dealing with people fairly. Uh, it is broad range, it is a broad, wide sweeping resolution. There appear to be no exceptions to this level of condemnation and therefore calling on the church to, uh, in essence, repent of ever supporting such crisis pregnancy centers. Um, that passed the House of Deputies, but I would hasten to add that the reason it passed is because it was not open to debate. Right now, because there's such an extraordinary level of resolutions that we have to deal with, over 400 in the matter of four days, a lot of things wind up getting referred to what is called the consent calendar. The consent calendar is meant to be reserved not for controversial resolutions, but non-controversial ones, that there is the assurance on the part of the committee that put it on the consent calendar would not have any difficulty in passing. And it's rapid fire. A resolution is called for, AO39, say hypothetically, uh, is there a movement to accept, moved, is there a second, second, all those in favor say aye, opposed, so ordered, bam, you're on to the next one. And so what that has done was left people in the House of Deputies scrambling to keep up with the pace of the voting, which meant that there was no opportunity to try to call for a vote to take such things as that off the consent calendar. The same is true in the House of Bishops, except that we have a different process and we don't automatically have things that we just sort of take up like that, occasionally, but not very often. As a result, that, in my opinion, is the reason that that terrible resolution passed. When it got to the House of Bishops today, 
it was immediately objected to when Bishop stood up and said, I know crisis pregnancy centers that don't engage in the kind of behavior this is accusing all pregnancy centers. This is an overreach at best. It's taking the experience of several people who put the resolution together and generalizing it to include all pregnancy centers and it's a bad resolution. It looked like that was going to fail when someone stood up wanting to offer, in essence, a um, substitute motion. That was passed and that sub substitute motion will be presented to the House tomorrow. The third thing that happened, of course, is that um, Julia Ayala Harris was elected the new president of the House of Deputies. Julia Ayala Harris is a graduate of Wheaton College and from the Diocese of Oklahoma. And her election was, is seen in some ways as a victory of people who want to take a more moderate and less partisan tone to that which happens in the House of Deputies. We will see, but certainly when she came and greeted the House of Bishops to a standing ovation, I might add the kinds of remarks that she made within uh, her greeting to the House of Bishops was extraordinarily uh, conciliatory, warm, friendly, and even humorous. Uh, this could be the start of a different relationship between the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops. The last thing I want to call to your attention was a uh, long conversation that happened within the House of Bishops about a constitutional amendment that was put forth to try to, in some ways, unencumber uh, prayer book revision and to create a more streamlined process for that to happen. Um, many people were deeply concerned when that was pre uh, presented that what we were really doing was creating a whole new and easy way to bypass the Book of Common Prayer. As a result, a substitute motion was presented that put all the safeguards in place uh, that we usually have in terms of categorizing liturgies as experimental or trial use and the process of making sure that the Standing Committee for Liturgy and Music remained involved. Um, that latter resolution passed by two votes and an, and an abstention. So the presiding bishop, and I think appropriately said it's clear we are a very divided house about this, and called on the uh, organizers of both of those resolutions to be able to meet together and work out a compromise. Uh, they did that. That compromise was presented today in the House of Bishops and was in fact passed unanimously. It put all the safeguards in place around creating a pace for liturgical revision. It acknowledged the memorialization of the Book of Common Prayer and underscored the fact that that should in fact be used in all dioceses and that no person should be restricted from continuing to use the Book of Common Prayer. It also created a system for liturgical revision that met with um, really endorsement on all sides. It's a good resolution in a lot of ways. It will now go back to the House of Deputies because they have to concur if that is going to pass. If it passes, that means it's passed its first reading as a constitutional revision because revisions to the Constitution require two readings in two successive conventions. So it still has some hurdles, but it's definitely, in my opinion, a step in the right direction. Please continue to keep us in your prayers, and thank you very, very much for your support. God bless you. Thank you again. Goodbye.